Great. Okay. Um, so, pleased to be here. This is uh, great. We're going to talk a little bit about quantum computing, which is really a weird subject, at least in this universe today. And uh, so, but we'll give you a little glimpse of kind of where it came from, a little bit about where we are today, and then where it's going in the next 17 minutes and 31 seconds. Um, so, this is the idea for quantum computing has been around for the computing part since about 1982. But the idea, we're, we're basically what we're trying to do are harness physics to do computing rather than doing computing to model physics. So it's kind of the opposite way that we normally did high performance computing stuff. And so the ideas behind quantum physics started appearing, you know, 150 years ago with Max Planck and uh, Schrodinger, and I'll come back to him in a minute. And then I see some folks nodding so they know of his cat. And uh, uh, even uh, Albert Einstein laid some of the mathematical foundations for what we're doing today. Even however Einstein didn't believe in all of the quantum stuff, he said entanglement is one of the things that we use on our computers where we can cause in our case, our quantum bits or qubits to become entangled, and then they can operate as a unit rather than as individual bits, say. And Einstein said, you know, I don't really believe in that spooky interaction at a distance, but in fact, it's been proven that it works. And so basically, again, what we're trying to do instead of using computing to simulate physics is use physics to be able to see if we can do something useful in computing. And Richard Feynman was the physicist who many, most of you know of him or his name who in 1981 and 82 wrote a paper and said, you know, maybe you could actually build a computer that would uh, simulate or would, would use quantum mechanics instead of fighting it as we have for so many years. I met Feynman in 1983. I was at Los Alamos. I ran computing there. And uh, he, it was the 40th anniversary of Los Alamos National Lab, and Feynman came and gave a talk at this big celebration they had, most of the people from uh, 1943 were retiring or dying and things, so Feynman was there. And, and at the time, we were the largest scientific computing facility in the world. We had five crays and, and uh, all kinds of other equipment. And so I took Feynman and some other Nobel laureates around to see what computing was like in this modern day of 1983. And Feynman turned to me, we're standing in front of some of the crays, and he said, you know, young, and I can't do his accent, I'm sorry, but you know, young man, someday all of these big crays are going to be replaced with quantum computers. And I said something notable that not even I remember, like, wow, or cool, or something like that. That was the first time I heard of quantum computers, and here we are now some, you know, 40 or so years later, and uh, in fact, they're becoming a reality. So... What is a quantum computer? This is either the terminator's arm or at the bottom end of that is where our quantum computer is and it's a chip. And basically, rather than fighting against quantum mechanical effects as we've done with traditional computers for a long, long time, we try to harness them. And what we try to do is, in, as opposed to the world that we're familiar with in which our bits are binary, they're a zero or a one, and those bits are all separable. They don't become sort of linked together unless we force them to be linked together in a word, say. And if we hit a barrier in a traditional computer, whether that be on a transistor or if we're doing a search and looking for an optimum low point, say, we have to, if we hit a barrier, we have to put more energy into the system to climb over the barrier, transistor or search, to get over the barrier. Well, in our world, we use these three quantum effects. And the first of those is superposition, where our bits, which we call qubits, are a zero and a one, and both simultaneously. And in our case, they settle out to be a zero or a one at the end of one of our calculation cycles, one of our solutions. Secondly, we use entanglement. And with entanglement, basically, instead of our, say, if my fingers represented 10 bits, if my 10 bits here are in the traditional world, they're not entangled. But on our machines, if we can cause those bits to become entangled, that spooky interaction at a distance that Einstein didn't like, if we can cause them to become entangled, then in fact, we can operate on them as a unit and make sort of coordinated moves through a space. And then the third one, and the one which will be most obvious here in just a second, is quantum tunneling. 
And with quantum tunneling, when we hit a barrier, rather than having to put more energy to climb, over, climb up the hill and look down the other side and go down, we actually can tunnel through the barrier. And what the system's really doing is seeking a lower energy state. But we effectively, or you can think of it as tunneling through the barrier to get to a lower energy state. So we've demonstrated those three. There have been lots of papers now, probably 100 or so papers about those three quantum effects you, uh, running on, on our machines. And a way to think about it is it's going to be far different than anything that we've done before. Rather than adding or subtracting or doing bazillions of floating point operations per second, we don't do any of those things. This, you can make this machine add, but it's, you know, you and I can do it faster on our fingertips than you could do that with this. But, but, if you have a problem that you can turn into an energy landscape, here we have a three-dimensional representation of mountains and valleys, if you, if you have a problem that you can map into this really n-dimensional energy landscape, what this machine does is five to 10,000 times a second is it searches through all of the potential solutions to that and, using this example, ends up settling in the low valley or valleys, probably. So it's probabilistic which means that it isn't guaranteed that the answer it gives us is the best answer. But what we do then is rather than running a problem once, we'll run it 100 times or 1,000 times or 753, whatever your favorite number is, and you'll get a distribution of answers back. And if that landscape has very steep mountains, and I'll show you an example of a rugged landscape from Google, if it has very rugged mountains and a low valley someplace, and you run it a thousand times, then most of the answers will be in that low valley. So, you know, nine, I'll make this up, but 923 of them will be in that low valley, 47 might be in the next low valley, and some will be scattered around. But if that landscape, rather than being steep, is like the Sahara Desert, or like this stage, where there are no real differences between high energies and low, you'll get answers all over the place. So much, so unlike our, the deterministic digital world that we come from, this is a probabilistic world, and you'll get a distribution of answers, and the answers are dependent on what the problem's like. Having said that, it looks like there are three classes of problems that can be mapped onto this machine. And those are optimization problems, since we're searching through this landscape. It also looks like you can map some machine learning applications onto it, and then probably sampling, where you want a collection of good answers, a collection of answers, good or bad. So those are at least at the start the three classes of machines that it looks like it will be able to solve. This is these are two of the machines. Uh, they're in our uh, factory in Vancouver. And uh, the machines are, there are three racks in front of them, but the machines are sort of a 10 foot by 10 foot by about 10 foot high uh, Faraday cage or skiff for those of you who've worked in the classified world. So the machines are, uh, we need to make sure that they don't uh, become interfered with by radio frequency interference or vibration or a host of other things. And uh, so they come sort of in a self-contained Faraday cage. And then if we open that door and walked in, it's going to look like a big can. And that it's about this big around and about uh, three feet high or so. And it's shielding. And it's, you know those, uh, the Russian dolls whose name I always get goofed up, but I call them babushka dolls, but that's not right. There's, a much, there's the proper name for them. But if you took that can off, you would see another can, and another can, and another can. And if you took them all off, what you would see inside is this Terminator arm deal, or I'm gonna, I mean, you can all guess my age probably, but I'll show it even more, or like a doctor no death ray kind of deal is what it looks like. And it's actually a refrigerator. It's part of the refrigeration that we use. And you would see gold discs. And at each of those discs is where one of those cans stacks. And you can see the temperature going from, at the outside, it's room temperature. And then we use liquid nitrogen to cool it to about 50 Kelvin. And then at each stage, we use some uh, isotopes of liquid helium. And these, are sta these refrigerators are used in physics experiments. We figured out how to make them run months at a time, and uh, as you go down, it gets colder and colder and colder until at the very bottom of the arm, uh, the 
processor itself is running at about 12 to 15 millikelvin. I, I, I faked like I was going to fall off, but not yet. Um, and uh, so at uh, 12 to 15 millikelvin, that's probably the coldest spot in the universe, at least it's the coldest measured spot in the universe that we know of so far today. And our machines, hats off to the engineering folks at D-Wave, uh, these machines have run, the longest running one right now is at 22 months without a failure. So it's amazing to be able to keep it at that temperature and in those extreme conditions for that long period of time. And then if we looked at the very bottom at the processor, this is what it looks like. And it's a chip. The computer is a chip. And it's about the size of your thumbnail. And that's really what it is. Now, the, the, the chip, all this apparatus, and all the R&D and stuff cost about $10 million if you were to buy one. So it's a supercomputer class machine. But today, it's really one chip. And onto that chip, you model the, basically this energy landscape. And then it, five to 10,000 times a second, will sink to a low energy solution, and that's what you read out. And, and that low energy solution you can think of again as the low spot in that mountainous terrain. And it's a little hard to show you quantum computer stuff. So we have cool t-shirts, though. This one is uh, one of the thought experiments that was proposed by uh, uh, Schrodinger in 1935 or so about superposition was if you had a, which you don't really know what state the qubit in our case is going to be in until you measure it at the very end. So he postulated a thought experiment, put a cat in a box and maybe or maybe not do something bad to the cat and you wouldn't know until you opened the box. And uh, the other shirt that we have, is, or one of them, is that we build our computers out of squids. How many of you have squids in your computers? I bet not many. And our squids are superconducting quantum interference devices which are what we construct this, this chip that, oh, I'm looking at that chip, you're looking at that one. <laughs> That's, we, can, we make our chip out of these uh, squids, and uh, this was a previous generation that had about 1,000 qubits and uh, some 38,000 of these squids to make it work. So that's the heart of it today is one chip, super cooled, probabilistic computing. You have this energy landscape that you map onto it. And, okay, so that's, it's cool. It's the wildest technology around, at least in this universe. And why might people think about using it? Well, this was, uh, we have, I should say, by the way, this, we're a startup company, probably longest running startup ever. The, there were two PhD physics students at the University of British Columbia who took a class on entrepreneurship in 1999 and said, let's start a business. And so they started a quantum business. Well, that didn't work out too well, but then some other people had ideas about how you could actually build a quantum computer, and that's what led to where D-Wave is today. First customer was Lockheed, who bought a machine that had 128 of these qubits about five years ago. They since upgraded it to 500 and 1,000, and we're hoping they'll go to 2,000. Second customer was Google. Their machine is housed at NASA Ames in Mountain View, California. And uh, machine learning is their primary application or research on machine learning. And then third is Los Alamos National Lab, one of the uh, big DO Department of Energy labs. And then fourth is a small company called Temporal Defense Systems who are working on a cybersecurity application on the machine. So over the couple of years that Google's had a machine, they uh, said, you know, let's, now that we understand it better, let's see if we can create a benchmark, synthetic, it's not a real world problem, and see how it might run on the D-Wave machine. And we're going to make one, now that we know how the machine works better, that has really steep mountains, steep rugged landscapes, and some low valleys. And let's see how well it does compared to a traditional computer. And with this bench, and this is from a Google blog from uh, December of about a year and a half ago, it turned out that the D-Wave machine was a little bit faster than a traditional computer, like by 100 million times. Now, synthetic problem, not a fair comparison. You can find faster techniques on the traditional machine. But what it points to is that there is potential here. And if we can figure out how to harness it, there's great performance potential. So this is going to be something that will be mainstream in your lifetimes. You're going to be using these computers. So 
that's, that's one of the early pointers to the potential that it has. And in terms of applications or potential applications, we've worked with one of our uh, customers who looking at optimizing uh, the placement of uh, radiation for cancer treatment, an optimization problem. Another one is uh, uh, looking at material science. In fact, using the machine in a quantum manner to, m to uh, map it onto quantum behavior in a material. Uh, drug discovery, there's a company here that um, some of the investors and founders were actually from New Orleans. Uh, DNA Seek is the name of the company. Uh, their, their research activities are down in San Diego, looking to, are using our machine to look for drugs. And again, it's a pattern matching, or you can turn that into an optimization problem. Uh, image recognition, this, is, this, this particular picture came from Google. I should say that particular picture came from Google. And um, that was the first application that they ran on the D-Wave to see if they could recognize cars out of a set of uh, arbitrary images. And in fact, they were able to do that. Um, we've worked with some financial uh, folks on portfolio, portfolio optimization and a host of other potential applications. Uh, those of you who were Google Glass people know that you could take a picture by winking and uh, Google was, having, was struggling a little bit to differentiate between a wink and a blink um, or some other weird facial movement. And in fact, they used the techniques that we worked with them on in the car recognition, and the Google Glass wink detector was based on those same, same, uh, same techniques. And then uh, Lockheed has used our machines to help debug software, and then a whole host of optimization problems. And uh, so we just leave the, and I'm, we can make all these available to you so you don't have to write this down, but Los Alamos, our third customer, I thought you'd be interested in seeing sort of the breadth of the potential applications that they're looking at, and they range from about half of them are optimization problems, 20% are machine learning of one kind or another, and then a smattering of other things, cybersecurity, uh, included. And uh, this was from one of the presentations from Los Alamos. This is their slide, not mine. I think we won the heart of the fellow who did this presentation. And uh, we, about two months ago, were in uh, Germany for CBIT, one of the big IT conferences in the world. And a project that we had done with Volkswagen was uh, doing optimization of traffic flow of taxis in Beijing. And so they announced it at uh, CBIT. And it was uh, great and really cool. And we're moving the, you know, Moore's Law is not dead, but there's an alternate to Moore's Law. And in fact, this is what we do, where every two years or so, we're able to roughly double the number of qubits. And we expect to be able to stay on that path. And so with that, I would say quantum computing is here. And I'll be back. <laughs> Thanks very much, everybody.